Hey friends, Ashton here, and welcome back to another episode of Good, True, and Beautiful. Uh, I hope it's okay to say this, but we have one of our village elders joining us today. Um, A man that uh, I begin almost every morning uh, with some of his readings. Um, So many people with the last time that we had him on were like, who on earth is Mark Nepo? That was that was wheels off. Well, guess what? He's back. He released another book yesterday, Drinking from the River of Light. He's a man I look up to. He's a guy I want to be like when I grow up. And I am super thrilled to get to walk the journey again with him today. And uh, before the call, we just said, hey, wherever this thing goes, we're going to let it go. So uh, with that being said, Mark Nepo, welcome back. Well, thank you. That's so kind of you. I appreciate uh, all of that. Thanks so much. Yes, sir. Well, there there may be a few people joining us today that weren't here uh, on round one. Um, Just to kind of set the tone a bit here, when when you introduce yourself and your work in the world, where do you begin? Well, you know, I I, I would just say, you know, simply that uh, whatever I share are examples, not instructions. And all of my work has led me to uh, be in relationship where I can try to help introduce others to their own gifts and their own wisdom. So given that, I, I would introduce myself as uh, a poet, a philosopher, a long-term cancer survivor uh, over 30 years. I, I'm 68, and so I had a uh, a rare form of lymphoma in my 30s, which I almost died from. And, um, and you know, that really jump-started everything. By, uh, it was my transformational threshold. And, um, and, and let's say for everyone who's listening, it happened to be cancer. It could just as well have been beauty or surprise mm-hmm. or wonder. You know, it's a myth that you have to suffer you have to to awaken or to be an artist or uh, to be genuine. We have to feel deeply and truly and be authentic. Uh, and that is can be just as challenging with wonderful things as difficult things. So I you know I would just say that over the years i've I've started to understand that the poet in me is that part of me which sees. Mm. Uh, and, and the philosopher in me is that which tries to make sense and retrieve meaning out of what I see, but it's the cancer survivor in me that that's committed to making use of it. Mm. You know, the only things that remain abstract are things we don't personalize. If something, you know, touches you or me, if I, then I've, it's incumbent on me to look and see where that lives in my life. And then it gets very specific you know, um, Mother Teresa said, courage is doing small things with love. And so we, we're always coming back to the to the one step in front of us to take authentically. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. Great job given your bio, by the way. <laughs> oh, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> yeah, you know, I was revisiting some of your work. Uh, it maybe been an interview once. And I, and I think you said before that moment 30 years ago, you, you thought you were open, but there was actually more to be open there. I think you phrased it that way. Um, and it seems like you've really built uh, your career around that opening from 30 years ago. Well, that, you know, that opening for all of us, I really believe that, that every person will be given the chance to be dropped into the depth of life. Mm-hmm. And how we meet that opening um, determines... How, where our spiritual journey uh, takes off or deepens or, you know, in, in where we inhabit our true spirit. And so, uh, you know, again, that, that's the archetypal passage. And, and wherever we are, you know, whether you think you're an introvert or an extrovert, whether you think you're, you're brave or not uh, or open or not, there's always an edge to our openness, our courage, our authenticity and that's so so it doesn't matter if you know like when I was on the other side of my cancer experience and I think people who, who've gone through things difficult things probably identify with this you know a lot of people would you would say that I was brave and 
you know, I would like turn around, who me, you know, <laughs> like uh, I, I just somehow, you know, landed at the bottom of the stairs and I'm still here. Mm. And I had, I just did what I had to do um, and didn't think of it as brave, but was always working. You know, my early, early book of mine is called Finding Inner Courage. And, um, and, you know, I didn't write that because, and I don't write any of my books because, oh, I know a lot about courage. Let me share it with you. No, the inquiry of writing, and that's a lot about what this book is about, the in, the inner inquiry, whether it comes out in writing or any form of expression, but for me it's writing, that inner inquiry is how I learn. So I needed to learn whatever I, courage I had. I was at the end of what I knew. Mm. I needed to learn how to be more courageous, and it was through that inquiry that I learned more about courage and about where it lives in me or not. And the trail of that inquiry it was the book. So, you know, when, when going forward, there was no, um, no real uh, path or, or, you know, plan. And honestly, each book, I, this book is my 21st book, which I can't believe is way, way beyond anything I ever imagined. And, um, and not one book really arrived as the book I started, hmm. you know, and, and I think, but looking back, there is the curriculum of a soul, yeah. you know, uh, yeah. yeah. And so, so it's clear that, you know, my earliest book really is the book of awakening and once awake, my next book was the exquisite risk and I look back while well, it makes sense because once awake then I needed to take risks <laughs> right <laughs> and then came the courage book so once awake and taking risks how do I do that oh well, I have to somehow figure out uh, how to be more courageous interesting interesting so that that inquiry um, that you you speak of really is kind of the the awakening the alight enlightenment of we are all meant to expand. The expansion never ends. And that inquiry kind of is the looking into the heart space, into the soul space, soul space of saying, we, we, got, we must keep going. Let's take another step. Yeah, and, and I think that, you know, one of the things, how we make sense, meaning out of our experience, and, you know, as Emerson, Ralph Waldo Emerson, who, you know, if anyone hasn't yet read any of his works, I would love uh, to put a, a recommendation uh, <clears throat> for to be discovered by another generation. He has some most amazing essays, uh, inquiry into the very space we're talking about. But, you know, Emerson, he equated, he said, you know, that he, he basically, he said that, experience anyone anything that you would like to know any question you would put is waiting like a hieroglyphic in the experience you're about to live and it doesn't get decoded until you live it mm -hmm. and so I, I would take that and say that we each have a language of wisdom we just don't know the the, the language of it yet yeah. each and so every experience decodes another word. Yeah. And so experience by experience, we get introduced to where our spirit meets life. That releases wisdom. Yeah. Yeah. New layers, new verbiage, new texture, uh, color. It always continues to unfold. Yes, yeah. yes. And so, you know, like at the heart of this book, which really it was a joy to retrieve. I, I like to say retrieve rather than author. <laughs> um, and, and that, you know, that this book really is about the deeper life of expression, regardless of the art form it takes. And, and I mean art, let's widen it, not just the formal arts, but yeah. anything you devote yourself to, you know, it could be gardening, it could be taking car engines apart, it could be you know, raising or training dogs or stamp collecting. It really doesn't matter. But when when you give your whole heart, when we can do that for whatever time we can, that starts to be healthy for us. So so the kind of the main metaphor at the core of this this book is is breathing. You know, so we're here, we're talking and we know that we have to inhale and exhale. You know, we can't just say, well, for this hour, I'll only inhale. Yeah. It, it's not going to work. <laughs> and so this is how the heart breathes. 
the heart has to inhale and exhale. And the heart inhales by perceiving and feeling. Taking in the world around us. And, and, the, and the feelings within us. We can inhale both inwardly and outwardly. And, and we exhale, the heart exhales by expressing itself. That is, by giving what comes up in, through our heart and mind form. In, in out, it comes out of us. That's how the heart exhales. And so when you think of it that way, and I think that, you know, my cancer journey has helped shape how I hold this, you know, it's not about, are, am I producing excellent work? It's not about, no, you know, we exhale to stay alive. If we do that wholeheartedly, chances are the trail of that will be good work. But we're so, like... Uh, imprinted with such a manufacturing mm. mindset in the modern world that even meaning well, you know, we turn everything into a product. And so, you know, the re like, you know, I need to express so it, it doesn't matter. You wouldn't really care if I coughed I love you versus singing it in perfect pitch. It's not about that. It's about, you know, and I, I've come to understand that what is not expressed is depressed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so we all have to find, I believe, a personal form of expression through which we can come alive. And if we do that wholeheartedly, chances are we'll do pretty good work. Yep, yep. yep. This is probably jumping ahead, but I, a little bit of this conversation feels like you're talking about attachment, right? Attachment to agenda, outcome, um, what are people going to say? Will it, will it be liked? Whatever the, whatever the form you make is, how, how have you found, what, what have you cultivated within your spirit to release yourself from some of that narrative that is, what are they going to say? It needs well, to think, be a product, you know, whatever that I, is. Mm -hmm, sure. And so that, that, this is worth, you know, getting into here a little bit. And so, so personally, and I do think that, you know, you know, surviving cancer kind of helped me with that because on the other side, you know, I'm human. I, I, I care if people that I care about, you know, don't, um, you know, reject me or I feel it. But it doesn't define me because, <clears throat> you know, being forced to, to be here, um, I don't really care what people think I care what people feel and even there it has to be it's in a context of um, I think each of us and, and and this is kind of interesting because it's the life of expression that helps us uh, make a foundational connection to our own authority of being which is based on the authority of all being and so that doesn't mean that I'm immune to what other people, how people respond. I can feel rejection. I can feel hurt. I can feel all the human journey. But they're to be experienced and not define my entire being by them. And so, you know, so a good ex example is that if, if, you know, you and I are friends, or even better yet, you know, say that, you know, my father, who's not gone, but say he's who I really want his approval, you know, and he just is very hurtful. Well, that can crush me, you know, and, and then I might go back and try even harder to get his approval. And the more I go back, the worse it gets because he's not giving it. Yeah. Well, I've learned over time, that's all real. And those are legitimate feelings. But the more, like, the more devastated I am by that, that's an indication to me that I've lost connection with my foundation. And so rather going back and trying to get that approval, which is not coming, it's an indication to me I have to feel that rejection, but I have to go inward and reestablish my own authority of being so that that rejection can be in context and not all defining. So too often we go sideways when we need to go deep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well said. Well said. Well said. Um, and and so when you say, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say if you're if you're fully 
present, right? I think so much of this gets down to a oneness with the moment, a a an engagement with what is here and now and at hand. It's it's pretty hard if you're fully present in that to always be defended. It, it's almost like you really do move into the space of to be a gift, to, to, to give something away in this expression. Well, well, yes, to give something away. And again, I, I, I believe that, that this doesn't mean we remove ourselves from our human experience. We give ourselves over to it. Gotcha. And so, um, you know, because it's not, we could misconstrue this and say, well, okay, you know, I'm, I'm going to wall myself up and just connect with my authority of being. But that's not, you know, if that were the case, then flower, flowers would have roots and would never blossom. No, we, we are here to blossom in the world and endure the weather of life by having deep roots. So when we talk about this, this notion of how do we withstand the weather of each other's opinions or harshness, so, there, you know, we all need both solitude and community. These are two of the rhythms that everyone in their incarnation must negotiate. And so um, a great metaphor, a great teacher for this are whales and dolphins. So whales and dolphins, and we take this for granted because they're so magnificent when, and we know about this since we're kids. But these mammoth creatures are air breathing creatures that live in the deep. That's a miracle, you know, and they still, no matter, because they're enormous and they can hold their breath for a long time, they can go under for a long time, but they, they have to surface. So they have to go in the deep to immerse their entire beings in the, in the, the, the immersion of the deep so that they can stay alive and vital but they can't stay in the deep because they'll drown. Even whales will drown. So they have to break surface, which they means they have to go into the world. But they can't stay there either. They have to go back into the deep. And this is a great teacher for us because every spirit in a body on earth has to, like the whale and the dolphin, we have to go into the deep and we have to breach into the world. And we have to go into the deep and bre so breach into the world. So it's not a question of if we will do that. Part of the work of self-awareness is that every person has to discover what's your personal rhythm. Mm -hmm. Are you spending yeah. too much time in the deep? Are you spending too much time in the world? Are you suffering from an over exposure to one or the other or a lack of exposure to one or the other? So one more thing about, about this, and that is how that manifests in, in how we meet experience. So I started writing, and I look back, because I was giving attention. I was looking to recognize and verify the wonder of the world. In fact, you know, I started writing, I think, because, uh, you know, I, I was trying to keep the wonder in view a little longer, like these moments would appear and I would go, well, wait a minute, where are you going? I didn't even, <laughs> I didn't even get it really like, wait, don't leave. Yeah. And so I would start writing to try to capture it, like taking a, a heart photograph, if you will, and then work with the photograph because the wonder had gone on. Well, we get along in the world and then we're asked to get attention. And now this is the, the struggle between giving attention and getting attention. So there's nothing wrong with getting attention in terms of making your way in the outer world of circumstance. But when that starts to define us, our identity, we stop giving attention and that is life draining. So the more, so we have this struggle, you know, now what do we have in our, our, in the last 20 years in a reality TV uh, you know, atmosphere or subculture, we are desperate to get attention, to be recognized and verified, to seek celebrity when it is giving attention mm -hmm. that gives us something to celebrate. That's good. That's good. Beautiful. So it's, 
yeah, it's not the fault. Like, yeah, you got to send your resume or you got to try to apply if you're an artist to a gallery or to a publisher. So there's nothing wrong with that. But when that starts identifying, so let, let's take it all the way back to childhood. And that's the last kind of point in this constellation I'd like to raise here. So, you know, you're a kid, you're in the playground at recess and you're twirling around because it feels good. And then an adult comes along and says, wow, you know, you are so agile. That's beautiful. You ought to think about becoming a dancer. Okay. Or I scribble and I write and then somebody reads it in fourth grade and says, wow, that's really, you're, you're actually writing images. Did you know that? You should think about becoming a writer. Or someone else, uh, you know, yeah. you, our friend Sally in the playground, she likes to put her hands in the earth. And then someone says, wow, you know what? You might want to become a gardener. Now, th those that might be great. I mean, there's nothing wrong with directing people to their natural gifts. But again, we have to be careful because in even in doing that, we might become a gardener or we might become a dancer or we might become a, a writer. But it's staying a verb, mm -hmm. yep, yep. not becoming a noun that where our vitality lives and our edge lives and our authenticity lives. Well said, well said. Detach from the nounness, fall in love with the verbness. Uh, <laughs> say it that way. Um, so uh, let's talk the book, Drinking sure. from the River of Light. Um, why this title? Where, where did you t talk to me about I mean, you're one of my favorite metaphor guys. I think we're already oh. about 12 deep, and we're only just a few minutes in. So, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. so, Thank so, you. Uh, where, uh, where did you pull this? The dr drinking from the river of light. Well, this was amazing because you know I had a different title for this book, uh, working title, and uh, last summer, as we were, you know, kind of getting it all, you know, into final form, my uh, publisher sounds true. Um, uh, Tammy Simon and my editor there, Haven Iverson, and uh, and they said, you know, would you be open to looking for another title? This one's really we like this one, but after reading the book, like, would you just be open to seeing if there's a, a deeper metaphor or something? And so I said I was, you know, but I like the original title, but uh, but I said, let, you know, let's let's see if we can. If I don't find one, I don't want to lose that first title. So that was just as I was going to London last summer to speak and teach. And I was speaking, I was going to speak in St. James Church, which is where Blake, the poet William Blake, wow. was baptized. Well, for a poet, that, that's a pretty cool, <laughs> yes. that's a pretty sacred journey. So I purpose, I was speaking on a Monday evening and so I purposely, Monday during the day, I went to the Tate Gallery in London, which I could walk to from where I was staying wonderfully. And they have an entire floor that has Blake originals. And Blake, you know, had, had sketched, painted, engraved in small, you know, we're talking five by six inches, you know, eight inches at the most. Um, sometimes they were a little bigger if they were sketches, but they were all protected in a very kind of dark, darkish room. So the light wouldn't start to break down after 200 years, um, the, uh, all the fibers of, of the things that he worked on. So I was, I sp and I spent, uh, you know, honestly, I spent probably two and a half hours in that room and I know a lot about Blake, but there I discovered more. There's our edge. And I didn't realize that he had wanted, and this is a great example of, of how the vision keeps us growing, and then towards the end of his life, he had had a vision. He wanted to illustrate Dante's Divine Comedy with 102 engravings, and he wow. did all the sketches, but he, he started actually seven before he, he passed away. And so I'm looking at all this, and all of a sudden I come upon a sketch that he did of Dante drinking from the River of Light. And it's this print where this this river is, you can't see where it begins. It's like a waterfall that never stops. And he's kneeling and drinking from it. And I just like was, you know, opening to that moment, 
you know, and, and the thing is that the mo- why we open to the moment is because the moment opens to eternity. So I was there, I was sitting before this thing, and all of a sudden I was just struck. Like I thought, wow, you know, Blake, Blake didn't. I don't know if he realized that he did a self portrait here. Mm. It was him drinking from the river, and then I, I stayed longer, and all of a sudden I, whoa, my heart started going. I said, actually, that that's a portrait of me. And actually, it's a portrait of everyone who ever tried to create or write. And then I realized, well, this river of light is like life force. And when we try to, to like we were talking earlier, express ourselves, when we try to let what is in out, when we let the heart inhale and exhale and we're authentic, we're drinking from the river of life force. And then I realized that was the title of the book. Bingo. Drinking from the river of light. Wow, beautiful. Um, what'd you say about moments? We open to the moment because eternity unfolds in the moment. Yeah, Repeat that the again. reason, you know, the, the moment is wonderful, not just because it pulls us out of the past and the future. The moment is is holy because when we give ourselves over to whatever's before us, it opens us to eternity. So, you know, we were all taught or I was taught, you know, that, you know, that rationally eternity is like stacking years one on top of another forever. Well, that's not what my experience, my experience is more like if you drop a a drop of water, like rainwater into a lake and it ripples from the center out. That's like the moment is the center Mm -hmm. where it ripples out and we get to experience our moment in the midst of all moments. Yeah, yeah. So that's why in a moment of, tr- of love, we get to experience all love. Yeah. You know, or in a moment of pain that's truly met, we experience all pain. And therefore, the moment experienced fully really deepens our compassion. Because if I feel my pain completely, I've also felt your pain and coming back from that experience of any one moment, my heart can never shut down again. So this idea of eternity, we're better off thinking, thinking more along the lines of a wholeness, a oneness versus a line of time that goes forever when when all things become one. You know, one of the the great Sufi poets, Ghalib, G H. A L I B, who was in the, in the eighteen hundreds, in India, lived in India, and he has a beautiful meta image. He says, "You know, uh, joy for the raindrop is entering the lake." That's Isn't that great? Yeah, that's joy good. for the rain, and and so when the when you think about, let's just spend a moment on that. When the when the raindrop, when a drop enters the lake, it doesn't lose itself. Mm-hmm. It just gives over its boundaries it adds to the lake so we add to the oneness by entering into it but we and so this this leads to something i talk about in the book a moment i have a friend who is a great jazz aficionado i mean he actually had a uh, a jazz radio station for several years and and uh, i i used to you know once a month or so i'd go over to his place and we'd have a jazz night where he would just with such joy, you know, put a listen to this one by Thelonious Monk, you know, listen to this. And he'd point out, but I, I mean, I loved it, but what I really loved was that he would get so moved by jazz that he would start tearing. He'd start, tears would come down his face. And as much as I loved the music, I loved going over and watching him cry <laughs> and listening to jazz. Yeah. And then we had lunch one day and and he said, you know, as much as I love jazz, sometimes it scares me because I'm afraid I, I'll lose myself in it. And I won't come back the same. And I took his hand and I said, but isn't that the point? <laughs> that, that, and this is part of the life of expression. This is what happens when we drink from the river of light. That by giving ourselves over to what fully, to whatever is before us, Whatever task is before us, as well as what we love, 
we want to def- we want to have a self that is solid enough that we can open it so it can be filled by everything we're not. That's right. That's the point is I want to grow. Uh, you know, Thomas Merton said, you know, before you can be selfless, you have to have a self you can let go of. Yeah. Yeah. So, and basically I think what you're getting at here in this part of exp- the expression conversation is once that self disappears, then really it's just the river of light that's being experienced by whoever experiences it. Yes. Yeah. So, so one of the, one of the things that's I think archetypal, and and let let's pause for a moment to just clarify that you know that we all hear that term a lot, but a lot of people may not be actually familiar with it. So, so you know, Carl Jung came up with this term archetype for referring to passages or thresholds that every person will go through, but but how we go through it is unique. The details are different. So. Each of us are born, each of us die, each of us experience, uh, you know, wakefulness, each of us experience uh, sleepiness, we experience friendship, betrayal, distrust, loyalty, all these are all archetype thresholds we walk through, but no two people go through them, you know, the same way. And, um, and I think that this, this threshold or this archetype for us of how we gain us inhabit ourselves and then how love and suffering break down our barriers so we can be filled by all other life you got to have a self to lose before there's that self to find Yeah. yeah So, um, question, you, you talk about, uh, expression as a conversation with the universe, expression as a conversation with life. Hold my hand on what you're getting at when you're talking about this conversation. So, so one of the things, you know, the term autobiography we know is like how we tell our life story. Well, I, I would like to, to me, you know, I would like to open that up. So a diary is just an outward chronicle of the events of the day. I went to the store. I fed the dog. You know, I ran out of gas. I got gas, you know. Um, An autobiography is, is more deeply, how do I reflect on what happened in my day? And I would say more deeply the conversation of expression with the universe is, how do I stay? What's the what's the trail, the expressive trail, the journal, if you will, more than a diary or a reflective piece on the ongoing conversation of the part that is me with the universe that is the whole, like a fish swimming in a river. The river never stands still, nor does the fish stand still. And the fish has to find its way uh, in and out of the currents and catch the current, align itself with mm. the currents, yeah, yeah. which is actually that notion of aligning the fish aligning itself with the currents is a way that Taoism speaks of itself as a as a a way of understanding life that it, that as spirits we are trying to align with the invisible river of life. And and how we do that, that really brings up the proper, I feel, use of will is not to bend the river or conquer the river. But how do we f- align ourselves with the currents of life? And 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 so this deeper conversation is that, you know, everything that's larger than us is so big that we kind of think it's inert. Well, it's not. It's all alive. The universe is alive. The wind is alive. You know, I think this is where indigenous wisdom has a lot to teach us because it sees every, you know, Native American cosmology sees everything as alive. And therefore, what, you know, like you're alive. So if we're friends, I'm in a con, our friendship is an ongoing conversation. 
well, how do we befriend life? How do we befriend all the things we see? It's, it's really hubris on human beings' part to say that everything that's not human or animal is inert. Right, right. Wherever you have spirit and matter together. Yeah. And, yeah, and yeah. there, because when we say it's inert, we stop the conversation that's right. and we stop learning from everything that's not us. Yeah, yeah. So what I'm really trying to offer here is a way to, if we, if we accept that everything is alive, how do we stay in conversation? Well, I think through our, the life of our expression and that doesn't have the conversation doesn't have to stay in words. It, you know, it can be through movement. It can be through vi- visual. It can be through listening. Again, it can be through, and that's where our inhabiting. So here's, a, you know, one of the ways I and, and I'm looking back. You know, it's a story from my father's life, and, and my father was a master woodworker, and. Um, so he was a great creative force in my life, though he didn't understand the kind of creativity I've been drawn to. But I remember, you know, now that he's gone, he lived to be 93, died maybe four or five years ago. And But I remember now there's lots of lessons that are coming from him since he's gone that I don't think he knew he was teaching, and I certainly didn't think I was learning. And um, and so he would make, he, he built a 30-foot, sailboat a catch uh that i spent a lot of my youth on and he also would build these two scale these model boats they might be like two or three feet long he would get planned actual blueprints from fishing sailing ships from the 1800s and then he would build them to scale so he had a workshop in the basement and where we grew up on long island and uh i had a little small you know suburban house and and I remember being like eight or nine, sitting on the top of the basement steps. And he didn't know I was there, and I was just watching him. And he would spend all this time, you know, with tweezers, like making little miniature rigging, and then, you know, make carving a, the rail of the boat or the bow of the boat. And I could could tell now. I can see all these years later. What mesmerized me was not his excellence but his immersion mm, yeah. and all that in. all in. Yeah. And, and, and so there we are again. I realize now that his immersion, his immersion, when he was immersed, he was in the moment of everyone in history who ever built a boat <laughs> and the moment opened eternity, as we were saying, and excellence that the, that the, the, the physical model was excellent was a byproduct of his immersion, the way a flame will give off heat. And so that's how we stay in the conversation with the universe, is by our immersion. Now, life, by its nature, you know, the difficult things, pain, worry, anxiety, fear, doubt, insecurity, these things like undertow will push us away. And our job is to lean back in and to hold nothing back, to immerse ourselves just when we're being pushed away. And that's how we continue our conversation with the universe, giving ourselves over to whatever form of expression might come. Whatever it is. I mean, I think in the book you say, this isn't just reserved for the poet, the musician, the author. Uh, this is, you make a meal. This is a, a moment of empathy. This is uh, someone you have compassion for. The medium, don't lose the don't lose the frequency when we're talking about the medium. Uh, whatever is at your fingertips, can be a place to tune into this conversation with the universe. Tune into that frequency. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. And and this is why you know whenever we do that. We have these extra, these peak moments, we call them. You know, like all of a sudden I'm, I'm busy and I, uh, I'm, I'm going for a walk with my dog and I got a lot of things and I, I you know, and I got to tend things. And, and then despite all of that, I slow down and I stop because 
the light and wind braiding through the branch of a tree stops me. And then when I stop myself and stay in conversation with it, which means I immerse myself, then all of a sudden that branch where the light and wind are going through looks extra real. It starts to glow because I have stopped and immersed myself. Eternity has opened. And it's always there, but we come in and out of receiving it based on on how present we can be. And no one can be 100% present all the time. So we come in and out of it. And so the practice is always one of return. You know, medieval monks would say, when asked how they practice their faith, they would say, by falling down and getting up. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. So I will, you know, savor that moment, learn from it, and then I'll fall out of it. And then I got to immerse myself again. You, uh, you just used that word glow. And I remember right in the beginning of the book, there, there was a sentence there that really touched me when you said, when moved to drink from the river of light, we start to glow. And I think, what a beautiful question to ask myself in the midst of the mundane, in the midst of strife in the midst of work whatever it is am i glowing am i am i drinking from that river of light that i may be glowing and listen you know a holy person you know an integrated wholesome person when from their glow it's very very it's something you can as humans we can touch it when we've experienced someone that's glowing yeah and and it's all and also to i want to reaffirm this sense that you know uh that you know, e even the saints and sages, whoever you think they are, when they would stub their toe or break a finger, uh, they wouldn't, they'd lose access to the glow until the pain stopped. Like no one's exempt. And, and this is part of the human, so that we don't, like that's so true what you said, but I just want to couch it so that we don't, uh, so no one can mishear our conversation right. and ele falsely elevate it like, oh, yeah. I want to aspire to that or how will I ever reach that? No, we're all in it. Yeah. We're all in it. And, you know, this is the, the humbling beauty of being human is that, you know, today we could be in a cafe and I could be so attuned and glowing that your tea starts to spill off the table and I will be so attuned I can catch the cup before it hits the ground. And we can go back to the same cafe tomorrow and I'll spill it on you, you know, <laughs> and that's okay because we're human. It doesn't mean that we have to judge like, oh, I've arrived because I was glowing today and I failed because I spilled it tomorrow. No, this is the rhythm of the whale breaking surface and diving in the deep. You know, they don't even do it perfectly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and we learn from all sides of the journey. You talk, you've talked somewhere about the razor thin line, the paradox between suffering and beauty. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I feel like you're touching on that right there. Well, you know, the thing is that we, as human beings, we often have to, put a pause on life, go aside and, and look at things separately to try to make sense. But in life, they're all one. So, you know, we often, we often pause to make sense of suffering or to make sense of beauty. And the truth is they're all braided in this miraculous yeah. mystery. Yeah. And, and so the, the challenge really is I've learned how do I let beauty in while I'm suffering? How do I let beauty in while I'm suffering? And, you know, I had a moment, uh, oh, probably 10 years ago, uh, with the most difficult part, uh, physical part of my journey since my cancer journey. And it, and it was somewhat related because, you know, I, I had neuropathy, I have neuropathy from the chemo I had all those years ago. And so that's made some other problems. So I had a stomach flu that normally people recover and I didn't. And what that meant was that I had this condition for about seven months where 
my stomach was backed up like a sink and and it's really a terrible thing and of course everything has a name until you get it you don't you know it's called gastropoiesis and uh uh, and there are people who have this chronically and they told, you know, the doctor said, well, we're just going to have to wait and see. You might never recover from this or you might. <clears throat> and I thought and I was lucky I, I did. <clears throat> but a lot of people don't, which opens my compassion even more. But the point of the story is that I would get the, when you have this condition, you can't you eat very little because you're not there's no room in your stomach. It, and and then uh, you because of this also you can't tell like today two bites the third bite might give you a pain in your stomach or tomorrow it might be the fifth bite so you never know and um, and and so we also so now the beauty side to set up this story is we have a lot of bird feeders at our window that my wife has done over the years that's one of the ways of her expressions she's a potter but this is one of her other forms of expression. And so where we live in Michigan, two days a year in the summer, Baltimore Orioles show up. So there I was with this condition, and there were the Orioles. This was the day. And so I started going to the window because I didn't want to miss them. And just as I went to the window, I got that pain in my stomach. And there you have it. There's the metaphor for all of our pain and suffering. It manifests in me in that moment that way. And it was a great teacher because the challenge is I can't deny the pain, but I can't make all of my life the pain. I, I can't not let in those Orioles, not just because they're beautiful, but because their beauty is part of the medicine. Mm, yeah. So there we are. How, how do we, no one knows how, but everyone has to figure out what's your personal practice. How do you not deny the pain you're given, but how do you not drown in it so that you can let in the beauty that's around you while you're suffering? And I believe that this, this wholehearted life of expression, this effort to immerse ourselves in the moment that opens to eternity Will, will give us a way how to integrate beauty and suffering. And so, you know, if we look at, um, uh, and let's look at water. Here's another metaphor. We all know water is made out of hydrogen and oxygen, H2O. But I can't say to you, oh, could I just have a glass of the hydrogen, please? Because if, even if you could separate it, yep. It would no longer be water and it would no longer be quenching or life giving. And that's the mystery of life. Life, like the H2O, the water of life ha is, is, is knit with beauty and suffering. Why? I don't know, other than I think that whatever created life, whatever name you want to give to that mystery, made life just difficult enough that we need each other. We need to hold each other up so that we can endure the pain to receive the beauty. And I think it's made life just difficult enough so that we need each other to ensure the journey of love. Beautiful. You kind of talk a little bit about that expression really is how on the human journey, we learn to fit things together. You, you learn uh, how our, our friend Richard Rohr, how he says everything belongs. Um, Every, everything belongs. You know, um, uh, Mother Teresa said, if we're feeling, <clears throat> you know, if we're feeling estranged, or it's because we've forgotten that we belong to each other. Wow. Yep. And, and so, yeah, so, so there's a chapter in there which you're referring to called, called Fitting Things Together, and that's because I traced the word art. And the word art means putting things together. Hmm. And so art, any form of art, any act, any gesture, any expression or feeling whereby we are putting things together. Art is the craft of putting, of fitting things together or discovering how the world 
goes together and keeping it together. So let me let me tell a little. This is a and and so when we do that, we not only put ourselves together, we keep the world together. So here's a story that's in the book. Uh, the, this is a Native American creation story, uh, a part of one. Uh, you know, the, often the Native American, the indigenous traditions have a suite or a constellation of stories, not one story that that tells how the world and all the beings came together. So this is, you know, here in Michigan where I live, the, the, the native uh, tribe or nation that was prevalent here was the Ojibwe nation. And one of their creation stories involves the work of the worm. So the story goes like this, that the great spirit was looking how to connect all the things in existence that he had created. When a little worm inched over and reached up and said, I can help, and, well, the, the great spirit was, uh, was moved that one of his smallest creatures was offering to help. And he said, very well, little worm, help us. So the worm inched away and began very slowly to spin barely seeable silk threads from its guts. And with those threads, it wove and connected everything in the universe. And so after this was done, you know, like a great spider, if you've ever been like in an old barn or something where there's a great spider web and you don't really see it until the light shines on it. And then there's this magnificent web. Well, just like that, you really couldn't see these threads that connected everything until the great spirit, like the sun, leaned over. And there they were, this beautiful golden web that connected everything. And so the great spirit said, thank you, little worm. You have saved us. Not by being brilliant, but by being true to your own nature. I will let you live forever. Well, the little worm was taken aback, and the great spirit could see this. So the great spirit leaned over and said, don't you want to live forever? And the little worm looked up and said, oh, father, I fear so many years if I can't grow and the great spirit realized the wisdom of one of its smallest creatures. And so the great spirit said, very well, little worm, I will give you this ability to spin these barely seeable threads around yourself. And when you can stop spinning and inching and squirming long enough, you will know the lightness of being that I know. Go. And so the little worm inched to the nearest leaf and began to spin the very first cocoon, and in time became the very first butterfly. Wow. Now, I, I <laughs> love that. Yeah, that's amazing, isn't it? That's, that's too that's, good. That's, that's too an good. amazing story. Yeah. I love these anonymous ancient stories. And what that says, and, you know, I tell it because of what it says to me, to my spirit. And what it says to me, what, what the whole reason I like to tell that story is because what holds everything together came from the little worm's guts, not from its mind, not even from its heart. Mm -hmm. So what does this say to us? It says, through our life of expression, through our introspection, we need, we must process, digest, and express our experience and when we do that authentically we're not just making ourselves whole we are at the same time spinning the barely seeable threads that hold the universe together yeah. so inner work is also universal work the degree to which we tune up is the degree to which the world tunes up yes yeah so forget, you know, people who are mod in modern age, people who are afraid of this kind of work will often want to denigrate it and say, well, that's navel gazing. Hmm. No, not, not, not true. We can do navel gazing, but if we do authentic inner work, the same time we are spinning the threads that hold us together, we're spinning the threads that hold everything together. It's one and the same work. That's good. That's good. And as you stay in that mindset of oneness, of a way of that, that new awakened reality, um, often, you know, tell with some of these people that I help coach a little bit, like 
you don't have to go look for anything. It, it finds you. It, you're, it, when you're on that awakened path, um, it's like a new well, set of eyes you see with. Well, it is. And so I like, I like to say that our career is our soul's awakening. Um, our occupation is where that takes place. Yeah, yeah. Say that again. Say that again. So our career is our soul's awakening. Our occupation is where that takes place. And so when we can be awake, so let's bring it back to, I'll talk about writing here because of what you just said, that, you know, all, like all artists or young artists or young writers, I was taught to be on the look for good material. What's a good story? What's a good metaphor? What's a good insight to write about? A good question to pursue. But after almost dying from cancer, being turned inside out, upside down, slowly learning how to be present, how to lean in, immerse myself in the moment, I don't need to discover good material. Everything is miraculous. That's right. All I have to do is be present enough and awake enough, and anything I give my wholehearted immersion to will be worth exploring so it can reveal its teaching and its secret. And this is where the creative process aligns with all the spiritual traditions, uh, all the different forms of meditation. It's not which bush is on fire it's that they're all on fire yeah. yeah and 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 it doesn't and why there are so many ways to express ourselves is because we will each be each of us will be drawn to a different one just just the way that in spring every year there are thousands of birds and insects and each is born with a an internal yearning to a particular nectar so they can pollinate a particular flower, fruit, or tree. There's the symphony. Yeah, otherwise you yeah. wouldn't have nature. You, no, no one is going to do them all. Yeah. You, nature wouldn't happen. You wouldn't have spring. So, you know, to translate this back to our, our nectar and our pollination so, and our creativity, you know, Mechthild, who was a female... Uh, mystic in the in Germany in the Middle Ages, she said, "A bird doesn't fall from the sky, and a fish doesn't drown in water. Each creature must find its God-given element." And so, for a a bird and a fish, it's pretty easy, but for us, as complicated, glowing, sometimes not glowing depth-seeking and surface-seeking spirits and bodies, uh, it takes a little work. Part of our initiation is to find our God-given element where our soul can breathe. So we have to discover where, where our nectar is and discover what we're born to pollinate so we can contribute to the human spring. And it, and it can change over time, right? Absolutely. Yeah. That's part of that's part of the expansion, you know. It doesn't have Absolutely. to always be this uh, uh, one way of expressing in the world. Matter of fact, it gets more interesting the more you let those edges start to bleed over a little bit. So, so you know, one of the things also that every human being has to negotiate because someone can be listening and saying, "Well, this is all great, but you know, I got to live. I got to pay the rent," and, and that's true. And so everyone, everyone alive, an archetype, is that everyone has to both survive and thrive. Hmm. Yeah. And so, you know, they are like two good feet. They help you walk. Now, but if you only survive without thriving, what's the point? And you can't just thrive only. That's like the whale staying in the deep. It'll yeah. drown. Yeah. You have, we have to f find skill sets in, in both. And sometimes, sometimes, like at this point in my life, I'm blessed that they are the same thing. But they weren't always. 
And and so, you know, and here's an example that couples what you were just saying about that it can change where we discover and are drawn to. So I have a dear, dear friend, lifelong friend who helped me through my cancer journey. And what I've always admired about him, his name is Paul, is that, you know, he did lots of very skillful things. He was an educational administrator for his surviving for many years. And but that wasn't how he thrived. And this just changed his his ex- art, his form of expression. You know, at one point, um, I remember he started an art gallery. We lived in Albany, New York at the time. And he started an art gallery from scratch. And for 10 years, it became like this amazing art gallery. Then it kind of like changed. It was done. It wasn't that the art gallery wasn't successful. It's like what was calling him changed and you know he wound up moving to maine and um and all of a sudden what is he doing he's becoming an apprentice mechanic foreign engine mechanic he's a he he spent a couple several years learning how to take porsche engines apart and putting them back together and then he that when that left he and all the while you know he did what he needed to do to survive but what was bringing his heart alive what was bringing his conversation with the universe alive he was being called to immerse himself in different ways and then he became he immersed himself in sumi painting being a, and i just so always admired how paul he didn't worry. He stayed in the verb. He didn't yeah, worry about whether good. he was going to become a mechanic yeah. or become a gallery owner. He just said, wow, like that that light on the tree that was glowing on the walk. He said, something's glowing here and I have to give myself over to it because yeah. that will keep my conversation with life alive. Yeah. And he rode that wave until it didn't do it. And it wasn't that being a gallery owner wasn't significant or important. It was that it stopped doing it for him. Yeah, yeah. You didn't need to judge it or him. It just had moved on. Yeah, I think whatever bit him has has bit me a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always uh, f- finding something about every six months that's new and keeping me curious. But uh, I love it. I love it. It's part of it. So. Um, before we go, uh, I, I think if I could, if I could say, what has Mark Nepo done for my life? How has Mark Nepo helped me in my journey of being human? I, I just love how you are a seer. Like you just, you, uh, you are in your moments, and you, you, you're always available to grab whatever may be there for you. Um, as you reflect on your last 30, 40 plus years of being awake and seeing what do you think what has been the the discipline the practice the routine the stance the posture what what's been the most important thing that's helped you become and stay true to being a seer well thank you that's a wonderful question so so let me just say to begin with that before i had language for any of these things i i realized that you know, one of the particular ways that I was born with my yearning for depth and surface was I just have always seen the world. The world has spoken to me through metaphor. I think that was my innate language uh, before I even knew what a metaphor was. You know, even as a little boy, when I'd be left out in the yard alone and the wind would go through the trees, I didn't, it wasn't like in words, but I look back and it was like I was never alone. The trees were like saying, the wind and the trees were saying like, Pay attention. Look, we're, we're, one's going through the other. We're like what? Like what? Come on, come on. What's it like? And so I, you know, it was like that's. I was always in company of of the elements of the things around me. You know, or or if I saw a worm struggling up over a, a brick, the crack in a brick, it was like, okay, what is this like? What is this passage like? And it was only later that I learned that oh, that was a metaphor or. You know, that what I was seeing and what really what was happening is the moments of glow we were talking about were teachers. And the way that I innately was able to get the lesson was by seeing what metaphor these moments of glow were teaching. And so over the years, how I what's helped me and this is where what we've been talking about is whenever I've drifted or been under a cloud or in pain or 
disoriented or, you know, have static in my mind, it's that immersion, it's that being present, returning to how rare it is to be here at all. Whenever any of us can recover being another Adam or Eve, that moment of like, my God, I'm alive and out my window are these things which we've given a name to trees, but I can even see them in those moments below their name. Yeah. There are these yeah. things growing out of the ground, yeah. and there's things growing out of wood. Yeah. Yeah. How is that happening? <laughs> and and so to recover, like the through through presence. And this is whether you're a writer or not. This is just living. This process is really about living returning to wholehearted living so that, you know, we will get static and we will, you know, I'll, I'll get off the phone and I'll take the garbage out tonight and maybe trip and fall down and forget everything we talked about and have to relearn it tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. And isn't that wonderful? What else would we do? We think there's a lot of other things to do, but what else would we do? Yeah. You know, so I think for me, it's returning again and again and being willing to to see things. And, and so this is I know we're getting close to time here. So let me but let me give a story when you say what what has served me. And and this is um, a story that one of the first Chinese uh, poets I uh, came across Tu Fu from the Tang Dynasty was so. Any of his work that's translated is so alive and so real and so authentic. It's like that was someone like the first writer I read as a like a 19 year old that I want. I wished I could talk to him. I, he, he became a friend across the centuries. And so as I was, you know, as a young man, hoping I would be if I worked hard enough, maybe maybe I could become a great poet or at least maybe write a great one great poem. You know, that was the thing. And then, you know, um, and so as a young man, I, I had this dream in which uh, I was looking to get his advice and his teaching about all this, you know, to ask him about fame and greatness and all that stuff. And so someone had told me in the dream that he was, he was up on a mountain. So I was climbing the mountain to go see him. To, and halfway up the mountain, he was rushing down the mountain because he was needing to find his family down in the valley. And we met halfway up and, and, you know, in the dream, he looked at me and I was like intimidated and in awe. And, you know, I was like, oh, 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 oh you know, I didn't Mr. know how Tufu. to ask. Mr. <laughs> Tufu, oh, did we meet you? Sorry, sorry to bother you, you know, <laughs> and, and he read my mind and read all my questions and was impatient with my hesitation. And he just put his hand on my shoulder and he looked at me and he said, if you can't see what you're looking for, see what's there. It's enough. Mm. And then he went down the mountain. And in the dream, I turned around. And instead of going up the mountain, I went back into the world, down the mountain. And then I woke up, and, and that changed everything for me. And I think that's the key lesson is that everything's miraculous. Everything's glowing. And if you can't see what you're looking for, it's okay to look for things. But they're the kindling for the fire of the heart. They're not the goal at the end. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so that, so it's fine to look for things, but let them burn up in the fire of what is. Because if you can't see what you're looking for, see what's there. It's more than enough. Yeah. One of my favorite quotes, Paul Valery, to see is to forget the name of the thing one sees. Ah, oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. yeah. That's what you're getting at. Yeah. Brother Mark Nepo, super, super grateful for you, your work in the world. What a blessing it's been to me. Um, I know all of our crew here at Good, True, and Beautiful Podcast uh, are thankful for you. Thanks for joining us again. Oh, you're so welcome. You're so welcome. A joy. A joy. Uh, I, uh, I'm sure that... Uh, Drinking from the river of light is going to take you down all new paths. And um, I wish you nothing but the best as uh, whatever that mysterious journey looks like. I hope it's a beautiful one. Oh, thank you. And you too with your work for sure. 
All right, my friend. Well, thanks so much for joining us. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. Hey, before you go, don't forget to hit subscribe right there on your phone. That's probably where you're listening. Uh, And if you enjoyed this, would you mind leaving us a review? One of the things that we're wanting to do is get this information out to as many people as we can. And we are finding that uh, when people leave good, true, and beautiful reviews, uh, that helps us get this information out more and more to people all across the world. I do not take it lightly uh, that you invite me to ride shotgun with you in your car. Uh, You allow these conversations to be a part of your jogs. You allow these conversations to be a part of the communities and families and businesses that you've been entrusted. Uh, I do not take that lightly at all. And I am thrilled uh, that you have joined us here at this table, at this conversation. There's always a seat left. There's always room for more. uh, And we are just so grateful for you guys joining us here at Good, True, and Beautiful. And as you approach this week, may you pause by the orchid. Listen to the bluebirds sing and be love.